And here's a zoom in here of Spasuga Island. This is the, in the original image that I showed you, there was a lot of mortality here, there was a lot of mortality here, and there was a lot of mortality here on Spasuga Island. And you can see why. It's because these are real focal areas of eagle movement activity. These are real hot spots. And this black material here, these are um, electric lines. And so you can see where these high spots of activity overlap with the electrical infrastructure, we're getting a lot of mortality. And so these would be prioritized as areas that we need to change the electrical lines there to protect the eagles. And so this is the direction we are going uh, with this research in order to try to minimize some of the impacts of the electrical infrastructure and help DOD make sound decisions about what they should do with their um, electric lines. So the rate of land conversion to urban use is unprecedented currently. I didn't talk a lot about that. Uh, we could have talked for an hour about that, uh, but it would have been pretty boring. Uh, <laughs> but demand for residential is highest along the shorelines. We all know that shoreline uh, land is very valuable. Land conversion leads to a suite of indirect impacts like uh, electrical infrastructure, mortality, things like that. Uh, eagles are becoming more tolerant of humans, and uh, this is a positive sign for us. You know, if they can move into our neighborhoods and be okay, then we don't have to worry as much about the loss of some of the, the nesting habitat that they require. Maybe we can coexist. I should point out, though, that currently, uh, when we look at the overall population of Virginia, the ones that nest in urban areas are less than 5%. Um, so it's still a relatively small portion of the population that is moving into these areas, but it's at least moving in the right direction. Birds are beginning to habituate to human. Uh, slow increase in urban nesting, and the lower tidewater area, as in Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, is sort of leading this trend in the state. We have more pairs in urban areas here than we do elsewhere in the state, for whatever reason. And the one right here in the Tampa Gardens is a good example of that, and how well they've done here in this setting has been spectacular. And we, we have ongoing research to look at secondary impacts. I wanted to mention that we are sort of reaching a uh, capacity, and there's some implications uh, for that. Uh, yes. Um, so I wanted to just mention briefly here, um, so this is a, a modeling uh, exercise, and we don't need to be worried about the theoretical ecology. What I want to point out to you is, that once we reach saturation, and in this particular case, uh, saturated at 100 pairs, what happens is that the population continues to produce chicks, but those chicks don't have a place to go. And so we get all these floaters at reproductive age. And it turns out that if we go along this line here, we reach a stable point, which is a stable age distribution. And the point I want to make is that we're right now at about 1,500 pairs here in the Bay. That's about 3,000 3, breeding adults, right? Well, the implication is a saturation that all of these other age classes are about eight times or so the, the breeding adults. And so when we, even right now, at 3,000 um, breeding adults, we are probably at 15 to 20,000 eagles in the bay. And the balance of that are either in floaters that are reproductive age or juvenile birds. And so we're, we're heading to the place where we have just huge numbers of eagles here in the bay, which is a great you know, a great success story. So there's some consequences of that for the breeders, isn't there? And we've seen that here at the Tampa Garden. And, and, uh, here's, a, here's a sequence that shows that. So here's a bird that's incubating here. This is a third year bird. Okay, this is a sequence that shows this bird coming down and attacking this um, incubating adult. And it was actually uh, another bird at the same time that was a fourth year bird, and it was circling around too. And these birds ultimately broke this nest up. So this, this pair failed, and it was a young pair. They were not able to fend off these um, juveniles, and it was broken up. And that, this territory was actually abandoned the next year, so they're not breeding there now. This is actually in Richmond. Um, but this is one of the consequences, is that there's a negative behavioral feedback loop of all these floaters being out there because they're wanting places to breed, and so they're wanting to take territories over. And so the result of that is that we have increased adult mortality and injury, and I'm sure it is getting more and more individuals in every year that are, uh, have been subjected to combat wounds and, more, and uh, deaths. And so we're going to see that continue to ramp up. And the other result of that is that we get a reduction in productivity because these birds are constantly breaking up nests. And the example here at the town of Cards right now is that there was such a turnover in young females there uh, that nobody got to breed, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I have a graduate student. Her name is Courtney Turney. This is Courtney here. 
And Courtney has been studying the intrusion rate of all of these floater birds. And she is using two types of camera. This is a nest cam. You can see this little bullet cam that was mounted above the nest here in the early part before the breeding season. And she's also using what we're referring to as an intrusion cam. Here you can see the nest. This is at Westover Plantation. And you can see that she is uh, off at a distance looking for intruders that are circling the nest. She's trying to quantify what the intrusion rates are to look at this negative feedback. For me, personally, in terms of the ecology of eagles in the bay, this is sort of the last chapter. You know, what happens um, internally within the population that brings that population into balance with the available space? It's this negative feedback that does that. You know, the population can't grow indefinitely because it runs out of space. It's this process, this interference, that brings that population into balance with the available space that it has. And so there's an important ecological mechanism that's playing out, and we're trying to study that now. Ah, now we get to the end, and that is that, um, just a couple of comments, and that is that people like me who are interested in avian ecology and spent our life, you know, in avian ecology, we think, at least when we're young, that avian ecology is sort of the answer to conservation. That is, if we understand what they need and we understand uh, what their issues are and what it is, how they interact and that sort of thing, we can um, effectively uh, conserve them. But as we get older now, like me, uh, we realize that um, ecology is only a small part of the pie, isn't it? And that is that um, there are other disciplines here that come into play that are really effective here, and that's sociology and economics. Those other disciplines, you know, have to come together for us to be effective in conservation. It's not just knowing what the birds need and their ecology. It's these other disciplines that have to come into play. And so the point is that <laughs> <laughs> conservation requires <laughs> conservation requires that people work together. And I think one of the great impacts of the botanical gardens here is that the botanical gardens has been effective at bringing people in to the equation. And that's what we need. You know, everybody needs to work together ultimately to protect these birds, right? And so uh, the Botanical Gardens has done a great service in educational and outreach to the public. And it, it's something that's priceless, really, you know, for those of us that are working in the conservation community. All right? So I, I'll end it on that note. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, birds are packing in tighter and tighter. And that's been going on for years now. And you know, we keep expecting for pairs to start to breed in, in higher densities on the eastern shore, which they are, but most of the packing is, occur is occurring in the lower saline reaches like Williamsburg, the Hopewell, and the James. And some of these birds are at incredible densities, and we have seen uh, pairs that are sort of, uh, you know, on opposite sides of a clear cut, and it's clear that the birds can sit on the nest and, and look at each other in the eye across the space. Um, so they, you know, some of the closest ones we have, uh, you know, might be 200 meters or so, not a mile. And they're really packing in tighter and tighter. Where that ends, we're not really clear. But it, it, they're getting closer and closer all the time. Yes? Um, I live uh, 150 miles west of here, over in the central Shenandoah Valley, and live on a farm. And for the first time ever this past, during this past winter, we had adult eagles on my farm. Um, and I believe also some immature eagles, maybe as many as five at a time. And while I am mesmerized by the, watching the eagle webcams and, and you know, love seeing these birds, my uh, question is, are they moving inland to establish nesting places? And can, can there, is there a habitat there to support them um, further inland? Yes, absolutely they are. And, you know, unfortunately, we don't have as good a handle on the areas beyond the fall line, say beyond Richmond or Fredericksburg, because we don't routinely survey out there. Occasionally, we'll do flights, and the game department's done some flights uh, of some of the inland areas, like the James goes all the way to the mountains, and we've flown the James all the way up there. What happens is that, you know, as, as we go above Richmond, the density drops off considerably as the, that um, water body narrows. And so where we might have a pair, you know, every couple hundred meters or so in parts of the lower James, on the upper James, like where you're talking about, or the Shenandoah, it's typically a pair every 10 miles of shoreline or so. So that, those parts, you know, those physiographic areas don't have the capacity to support the same kinds of densities, but they're definitely supporting more eagles all the time. So th those areas are being colonized rapidly, you know, all the way up the Potomac, all the way up the Rappahannock, all the way up the James, the Roanoke, the New, all those areas are being uh, colonized. There are several pairs now on the Shenandoah uh, River there, uh, but we don't have as good a handle on them as we do down here. Thank you very much, Ron. video from today on YouTube? Yeah, that'd be fine. Thank you.